All right, here's the room so far. There's the mural. There's my new floor that I did. The old fence wall. And I hung up a couple of wolves and a, and a grizzly bear to see if I could dampen out the echo in here until we get it properly uh, furnished. So, there it is. And there's my door. And it's almost there. scare him away. All right, I'm back. And another day of, a couple days of not much sleep. No biggie, you can sleep after death, right? <laughs> but I had, to, uh, I had to go to a coast to uh, grab my other boat trailer, it's ready. It was, it's been out there in and out of salt water for like five years. Had to get a bunch of work done so I could bring it home. And I uh, had to do that, so it's an excuse to go fishing. So I got up 4.30 or something and left, and I went. I did probably, I hiked a river for maybe two miles-ish of river bank. Uh, fishing and searching and fishing and searching and filming. And I think I saw four cutthroat trout in that entire time on the bottom. <clears throat> it's fun though, fairly addictive, but it's something that I, uh, it's funny, once I start an activity, I don't know, maybe I've got some kind of a mental problem, I don't know, but I'll put, I will put off deer hunting sometimes because I know once I start, I won't stop. And the same as the steelhead fishing, once I start, I don't want to stop. Looking for shit antlers that haven't gone yet because once I do, I won't stop because I want to find those antlers and, and reach that goal. It's really weird, but... It's raining for three days solid now, so the rivers will be blown out and that'll stop me from fishing. But anyway, side note, uh, when I was in the store in Bamfield, a young lady from the Pachina native band there told me that she had seen a Sasquatch 
right on the side of the Sarita River. And um, you right, she was driving. You, the, the road travels right along the Sarita River at a couple spots. So she saw it just standing right there, so it scared the shit out of her, so it was reddish brown hair. And uh, the same time, another young guy from the same community was in the store, and he told me about running into one on the Sarita River, and as well the Klanawa. I think a couple times in the Klanawa, him and his buddy hunting had rocks thrown at them, this thing standing up there in the timber edge looking at them. It's endless, right? What I'm saying is, um, that's where I run around, right by that timber. And yesterday, quick note on your senses and your sixth sense, your, your perception. I parked the truck, just getting light out, fairly light out, and uh, had to go had to go do my thing on the edge of the forest there for a second. So I we went over there the whole time, and I finally looked up, and there's five elk right there looking at me. I think one or two were laying down, so that means they were there the entire time. I did, and their eyes were locked on me the whole time. I didn't have a clue, nothing. I didn't feel anything, not a clue, right? Which is typical, but still, I'm just saying. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> probably about a few hours, a couple hours later, I'm into this one spot. I just couldn't stop looking around. I couldn't stop looking around. I was borderline feeling uneasy. I don't know why, just sometimes it happens. Sometimes you chalk it up as yourself. But I really felt myself looking around a lot, feeling a little bit of apprehension. And then, of course, once that does start, once you have been forced, this reality has been forced upon you and slapped in your face without you asking for it, like myself and basically 100% of all of you, um, and you've seen one of these beings before, then you can't, it, you have to work on keeping your anxiety under control because you start thinking right away, you can't help it. You start thinking, oh no, is this the day? Is this the day? Not today. I'm not into this. Not today, but that's what happens. And I'm sure there's literally thousands of you who are shaking your head. Yeah, me too, man. I totally get it. Right? And for all you people who are possible skeptics or interested in the topic and you don't have any experiences with them, um, it may be hard for you to picture it, but you maybe try just for a second. Try to be one of us if you haven't had that experience yet. Just picture it. You ran into an upright being that isn't a human being one time in your lifetime in the forest. Now, picture being in the forest by yourself, fairly remote, and uh, trying to keep those emotions under control when you start feeling like things might be a little off. It can be quite challenging. Right? And then, um, I hiked upriver for about half a mile, following elk trails, and then, and then you've got elk, right? There's elk all over the place, and we all know Elk and these sightings go hand in hand almost. At this point of the game, it's a pattern. So as I'm hiking through the big, you know, the big timber on these trails, and it's pretty dead quiet. And I'm thinking, oh God, here we go, right? And you're looking up in the timber, but you don't want to. You know what I mean? Like I'm looking up in that big dark timber rainforest, but I don't want to, but you can't stop yourself. And I'll just look away, say under my breath, just leave me alone, just leave me alone. And then uh, I hiked out of there through the timber, down the logging road, back to my truck, drove to another spot, which is right where that young lady saw that being standing right there looking at her. And I started to wade down the river. There's lots of willow overhang. And, um, and I had to go to the right side of the bank looking down the river. Because I have a tripod, I got my camera rod, I got my other rod. I'm running out of beach, there's no rock or anything, it's over, I decided to go stuff myself into the willows to put my tripod and my other camera rod on a branch so I could, so I could fish. And then I got on my knees in the mud, and then BAM! Something hit a tree. <laughs> Directly in front of me in the timber, it sounded like it, who knows how far away it was. It could have been 50 yards, maybe. Big, mature, never logged before trees and jungle in there. And then it was loud enough, and I'm right, I mean, my knees are on, my feet are in the water, my knees are on the edge of the riverbank, and it was loud enough, I'm messing around with my fishing gear, tying something up, and it was loud enough for me to go like this. <laughs> That's how loud it was, right? And there's big bull elk tracks on the side of the bank, just up behind me, solo bull tracks, but the big bulls don't have any antlers on their heads right now. I'm like, oh, hmm. So again, I set out, not out loud, but 
I said through my mouth, not my mind, I'm like, just leave me alone. Leave me alone. I'm not into you or the shit. Just leave me alone. And I carried on fishing for another half an hour and I left. But there you go. That was my day yesterday. And I got back, I don't know, 6.30 last evening. So it was a long one. Didn't definitely get any, any voices heard, but I'm going to now. And uh, I just showed you guys the room. And uh, I guess Sarah's going to get a curtain rod to get some curtains up there. And that should dampen out the semi-echo that's in here now. So I just... I threw a grizzly bear on this wall and two wolves on this wall to help damp dampen out the sound because, well, who doesn't have a grizzly and a couple wolves laying around, right? Now, let's get some voices heard. Very important, more important than me babbling. This is titled 1977 Military Base Sighting, Aberdeen, Proving Ground, Maryland, Current, in Vermont. Hey Steve, using phrases like to keep this short as. Hey Steve using phrases to keep this short as possible. My name is, I hope you are giving me permission to read your name. I hate it when people put their whole name and then I start reading in the end, they'll say, don't use my name. So my name is Jennifer Grant, age 54, horticulturist, winter school bus driver, Mad River Valley, Vermont. 11 years ago, lived on Officers Row, Aberdeen Proving Ground Military Base, Maryland, Peninsula of the Chesapeake Bay, many tidal inlets, much wildlife, giant carp feed in inlets at high tide, then go back out to bay with receding tide. Small lane behind my house, half a mile of woods leading to an arrowhead shaped tidal inlet at five football fields long, west end tip of the arrow shape, east end three football fields wide, 1977 sighting age 11. After dinner, I had to put my new bike into the garage, across the lane, up against the wood line. Felt creeped out. Dark out, probably 7.30ish, mid-October. Hurriedly, put the bike away, walked across the lane, back to the house back door. Looked across the lane to the wood's edge, wood pile, felt something watching me. Saw the outline, silhouette of a person hunched over at the end of the wood pile. Wood pile about five feet at ends, six feet in the middle. Thought it was a neighborhood boy trying to scare me. A tall eighth grader we call Fungi. He was already six foot at that age, and very tall family. Anyhow, I yelled, Fungi, knock it off. Stop trying to scare me. Go to your homework. The figure then moved backwards into the woods. No sound. Weird. Went inside, told my younger brother. The next morning on on military school bus that took us to two Catholic schools and my private school. Around 6 a.m., 6.30, our schools were off post around 45 minutes away. The bus stopped for a minute. Men setting up cones in the road for construction <clears throat> looked out the bus window through the opening in the woods to see the tidal flat from the arrow tip. I saw a large dark brown but grayish being from its back walking directly down the center of the big tidal flat. It was low tide. I knew exactly what I was looking at, and it was a Bigfoot. I viewed it from about two football fields away. Called up front to my brother, but the bus began moving. Went up and told my brother what I saw. Not possible for any human to walk anywhere in this mud flat, even at 80 pounds as a kid. You would sink in the mud, some places up to your mid-calves. We spent a lot of time back there playing, rescuing huge two to three foot long carp that didn't make it out with the tide. I knew about Bigfoot, but never understood the gray color until internet times. Current Vermont Info. Just heard your email from Sharon in Vermont. I have a fine gardening business with clients all over the hills of the Mad River Valley. Also, when driving school bus in the winter months, have a good view of woods from a more elevated position. I've noticed numerous tree structures in certain areas, and I've been watching these for the last five years or so. Large X structures, 20 feet off main roads. Not there one day, the next day, there one is. Also seeing signature structures in the woods at accounts, <clears throat> excuse me, seem to be made by the same person's creatures because of distinctive form. Too big and heavy for a single hoaxer to make. Two summers ago, I had a wood knock experience in the woods behind my house. My boyfriend is a Bigfoot skeptic, but he heard the knock and will not deny he did. No one in the woods but us. 
did send two Vermont researchers pics of structures. They want me to keep searching. Steve, fools rush in where angels fear to tread. I'm a Jesus-loving Christian. I spent 20 years living a vowed Franciscan life, basically a non-cloistered Franciscan nun. Left my vow four years ago. Spirit realm is real, <clears throat> and the others out there in the woods are real. I will not just have to move those antlers over a bit. It's gonna get a bonk in the eye again. Make my other eye red to match this one from Ruby Dog. Now, spirit realm is real, and the others out there in the woods are real. I will not search ever for these creatures beyond noticing my surroundings. Life is challenging enough without inviting unknown entities into my spiritual sphere. Is the veil thinning? I feel that something is ramping up beyond the evil ma machinations of men and earth. Men on Earth, NWO, Global Reset, Hidden Archaeology, etc., COVID, 80, 1984, etc. I don't think it's just because of the internet and information and that we are privy to more info. Interesting, too, that some, love Scott Carpenter, have ended harassment, etc., by calling on the authority of Jesus. I'm not a flighty spiritualist weirdo. I'm a hardworking, hardworking, I'm a hardworking woman filled with love for all of God's creation. The spiritual battle from the beginning of time rages on, and those with eyes to see can see what is happening, at least enough to know that darkness is ramping up its agenda. Abundant blessings to you and yours for all you do. May the good Lord bless and protect you going forward and making all your paths straight. May our Creator have mercy on all of us all over the world, believers in Him or not, for only He knows the heart of a man. Sorry so long. Keep on rocking, Steve. Ever best, Jennifer Mon. Jim, appreciate you big time. Thank you so much for sharing that. Donating your precious time to all of us through me. The uh, hair description of the grayish brown. Man, I can't believe I bonked my other eyeball. Oh, well. The grayish or brown with grayish in it or grayish with brown in it. That's a common description of the color of hair on some of these dudes, right? Blatantly walking in the middle of the tidal flat in front of human beings. Pretty bold. But not, not too many human beings are looking around or even trying to think of trying to notice something in that description anyways, right? Darkness. Bad times, bad people, bad entities. We'll see what comes. We'll see what comes. There's definitely some crazy ass shit going on. It's ramping right up without a doubt. Hopefully uh, more good is coming than not. That's all I can say at this point of the game. Be safe out there, Jen. Who's next? Man, I'm not awake yet. My experience, U.S. Army vet. Sorry about the few typos, but I wanted to share a few more details as the being got closer and stopped. Oh, the second email. All right, hold on. This is where it starts. I guess I copied two emails from him in here. I live in Alabama. I'm a former U.S. Army vet. I've been hunting my whole life. I grew up with a gun or bow in my hand from an early age of six. I know the woods. I know the native animals. I've hunted from Alabama, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, and Tennessee. I've hunted alligators, boars, wild turkey, whitetail, turkey, ducks. I fly fish all over from North Carolina, Kentucky to Kentucky, Georgia, Tennessee. I spent many a day in the wilderness. It's my home. Now let's get to the story. I went hunting with my dad and in 98 to a spot where you frequently hunted. I love the spot, killed many whitetails there. We were bow hunting in January. We park the truck, pack up the climbers and are on our back and head out. From the truck to the spot is about two miles of hiking mountain terrain. We get to my dad's tree and I continue to hike another three to 350 yards till I get to my spot. The woods are thick and I can't see my dad and can't see me. He can't see me. We're close. Normally I go further into the woods at this spot, but because he was bow hunting, we we're concentrating on four game trails that all come together and using the terrain as it funnels in two different spots. We had been hunting all day. Towards the end of the day, maybe two hours, two hours before dark, I see a few does come by. Shortly after that, I heard a strange noise that can only be described as a whoop. 
At, at that time, I had no idea Bigfoot behavior. We lived in such a rural community that we only had three TV stations and you couldn't get cable. I remember thinking, what was that? Not knowing or even thinking about Bigfoot, I sat there patiently. Now take note. The whoop came from the north of me, from the top of a ridge. Now, maybe 15 minutes later, I heard a noise coming from the south. It appeared to be walking in a northern, northern direction between me and my dad. I remember thinking, that's a man. And I was looking for orange. The sound got closer and closer. I believe if it had went any further, it would have stepped out in the open, but then it stopped. I was looking in the direction, couldn't see it. And then all of a sudden, it roared or yelled. It was so deep and loud, it made my chest rattle. My arms, my arms stood straight up. Me and my dad carried two-way radio with us and with earpiece and mic. He came over to the radio and said, are you okay? I said, yeah, but what was that? He said, I have no idea, but whatever it is, it's between us. Dad said, sit tight, wait for dark, and maybe we'll move out away from us. So night falls and I start down the tree. Pack my climber, get my bow, and start making my way towards my dad. Anxiety. Oh, sorry, anxiously, I walked, knowing that I'm heading directly towards whatever made that sound. That would suck. Bad. As I never heard it leave after the roar, so halfway to my dad, I started hearing it. It's I'd step and it stepped. I stopped, it stopped. I continued towards my dad, knowing it was close and it was real close. I get to my dad in one piece and I tell him, we've got company, something big is trailing me. He kind of laughed, but either way, all we had was a couple of bows and knives. So we start making our way towards the truck as soon as we started hiking towards the truck, it followed. We stepped, it stepped. We stopped, it stopped. At some point, it must have been within 20 yards behind us and to the left, and it was terrifying. Two mile hike with 40 pounds of gear in the dark is about an hour to 130 minute walk, depending on terrain. So it was an uneasy feeling. As we got to the creek and make our way across, we start hearing in a different direction. The wind changed and moved, and we were downwind of it. We could smell this skunky type of smell, but it didn't really smell like a skunk, but we pushed on. This thing followed us for two miles all the way to the truck. We threw a stand in the back, jumped in the cab as quickly as we could, and left. My dad won't talk about it. Neither one of us has ever hunted that spot again. <laughs> No doubt. I've been around gators, boars, bobcat. I've seen mountain lion once, coyote. All these, with an exception of gator, will literally try and get away from you. I've had no experience with grizzly or, or uh, sorry, I've had no experience with grizzly, just black bear. But point being is, they don't want to be around humans. I know what these animals sound like, and the don't sound like, sorry, and they don't sound like a 300 pound man walking in the woods. Furthermore, it was January and bears aren't around. So what was this? A random man walking through the woods in the dark without a flashlight for two miles? And roaring? <laughs> of rough country? I don't think so. i never seen what it was, but it wasn't anything I've ever seen or heard. I've been hunting for 37 years, and I've only had one experience that I can't explain logically. Thanks for all you do. Now this hunt was in the Talladega National Forest, close to Piedmont, Piedmont, sorry, when we were hiking down the Pinhoti Trail, Pinhoti Trail, P-I-N-H-O-T-I -I Trail, which runs the Appalachian Mountain Range, and no email. Thanks, man. And there's a familiar pattern, right? That is an absolute pattern that we've all heard and frickin' hundreds of people experienced. I stepped, it stepped, I stopped, it stopped, roared, rattled your body with the roar. I was picturing that roar yesterday when I was kneeling in the river there, and I heard that whatever it was hit the tree, I don't know what it was. I'm not saying it was some kind of a being. I haven't a clue. 
All I'm saying is my senses were a little bit on fire yesterday. Don't know why. You've all seen how often I've been out in the rivers lately, in the middle of nowhere. And, uh, but I, when I was on my knee on the side of the river and I heard that sound and then I, it was so thick right in front of me, I could probably see about 10 yards. And I was, I actually started to picture the roar. I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do if this goes on right now? You know, you're starting to think, what, what, what am I going to do? Please, please don't have this happen today. I'm not into this. And then as I'm trying my gear and trying to get my, my mind off of it, then I start picturing what it would be like to hear a, a mind blowing body rattling roar come out of that bush right there, 10 yards from me right now. And you can't help it. You can't help but start thinking that way and picturing these things when you're by yourself, 75 kilometers from any, anything in the middle of the coastal mountains where these things are running around being sighted yearly. Didn't happen. Thank God. But I'll tell you what, I don't envy people like yourself, man. And, uh, and hundreds of others who experienced that rib cage rattling roar in the woods. That'd just be a little bit much for a lot of people to take. And then to be followed by the damn thing that made the sound? Leave me alone, right? <clears throat> Thanks again for sending that in, man. This is titled Toshodi Experience. My neighborhood. Hey Steve, my name is John. I've been watching your channel for the past year and a half and thoroughly enjoy your enthusiasm for the outdoors and the unknown. I was born and raised in the Fort St. John area and I'm a proud member of an Aboriginal community north of the city. Worked with some of your uh, community members over the years in the mountains in the north. I know exactly where you are. Having spent most of my childhood and early teens on the reserve hunting and fishing, my curiosity for what else we may share the forest with always was in the back of my mind, and soon I began to ask our elders if there is anything our people may have encountered in the past. They shared with me stories of the bushmen, wild people, not monkeys, that lived deep in the bush and were treated with the same respect that any other creature that walks, slash, swim, or flies. That brings me to my experience. This happened in the fall 2017 in an area that I'm sure you're familiar with, the Toshodi. My hunting partner and I decided we would try our hands at a mountain elk, having only hunted the grain bulls of the Peace region. We planned an eight-day hunt, and after procuring a jet boat to take us up the Musquaw, and then proceeded up the Toshodi, we were on our way. Fast forward a couple days into our hunt, we set up spike camp at the bottom of a drainage. After spending a full day looking for elk in the bulls up the mountain, we came back to camp to recharge and make a plan for tomorrow. Laying in the tent, making dinner, we began to hear something walking on the bluff above us. Thinking it's a bull coming down to the creek and still having legal light, we grabbed our rifles and slowly creeped out of the tent. As soon as we got out, the walking stopped. We stood there for what seemed like forever and nothing. Not a squirrel or a bird made a sound which was eerie. After thinking it moved on, we retreated back to the tent. As the zipper shut, the walking continued. After listening more attentively, it didn't sound like something walking on all fours. It sounded bipedal to us. Thinking nothing more of it, we dozed off to sleep. Sometime during the night, I woke to rustling in the bush around us. I listened for a while, then dozed off again. I again woke. Just before daybreak, but this time I saw the tent above my head moving. It was as if something was trying to pinch the tent between an index finger and the thumb. I instantly called out, hey! And whatever it was, and whatever was there moved away up the drainage on heavy feet. The next morning we decided to move back to base and hunt close to the river the remaining days. And my me and my partner never spoke of what happened that night and haven't since. Another common pattern reaction. Thanks in advance for sharing my story. And I would appreciate if you didn't use my name. As Fort St. John's is small and my res reserve even smaller. Ha ha. I apologize. It's a little long. Stay safe, Steve. And most of all, thank you for being our voice. Hey, man. Thank you for writing in. And don't be scared. Listen, you wouldn't believe how many hunters have emailed me from Fort St. John where you are, Fort Nelson, the Yukon, Hudson Hope, Grand Prairie, Chetwin, 
Tumba Ridge. Mackenzie, Pine Pass. <laughs> right? You're surrounded. <laughs> You're absolutely surrounded by people the same as you and I seeing the same thing. Um, where you were. I've been up there too. If I even have a clip, I might have a clip of going up the river in a jet boat myself. Maybe I'll put that in here, maybe, if that's right there at the desk. Um, I have guided hunts north of Toshodi. So we would ride in from Tensi. Oh, no. Sorry, my brain's farting. Tetsa. We'd ride in from the head of the Tetsa River. Well, we'd ride in from Alaska Highway on horseback, obviously, for two days to get to where not exactly where you are, but I have been our guide territory. You know who who guides in that outfit area there. They're the guide territory border is just north of those lakes, and that's where I have been. That's actually where I, where I, I uh, bow hunted a stone sheep for myself there too. My friend and I, we rode all our horses in there for a couple of days. Anyways, about like, what I'm saying is two friends of mine, one used to be an uh, outfitter for a short time at a Toad River, Two friends of him and another guy from Fort Nelson, they rode in there. They rode in same direction using uh, Tetsa, rode to the head to get close to where those big rams are this side of, or that side of Tichoti. And they woke up early in the morning in camp with trees getting the shit beat out of them. And it was echoing through the valley right near there. So what I'm saying is you're not the only one to have experiences around there, man. They are there. Either they have been there, they're there sometimes, or they're there full time. I don't know, but you're not alone. And as well, west of your community is on fire with sightings. You should uh, you should possibly take it just some of your more prominent hunters in your community or people you know in Fort St. John or whatever. Just look them in the eye and say, hey, have you experienced anything something kind of weird out of the woods around here or somewhere? Something you can't explain or see something? If they say no, go, oh, all right. And they say why, go, I don't know. Sometimes I've seen some, heard some weird things, whatever, and shrug it off. They're not into it. But if they've seen, they're going to know exactly what you mean from the word go when you start asking the question. But if you want to gain more knowledge, man, do it. Ask around, your especially your community. And then you know you know about the crossing at Pink Mountain, too, right? That, that Sasquatch cut out in front of the coffee shop. You'd believe how many people have emailed me about sightings around Pink Mountain. Shit piles. And there you go. Keep me posted. If you hear or learn anything new, man, especially around there, because that's my backyard too, right? So if you hear any anything else and, and it's worthy, get it to me. I'm 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 curious. I want to know. <clears throat> Excuse me, you guys. Here's another one. A dead Sasquatch found by accident, Kentucky. Hey Steve, oh wait a minute, wasn't there a second part to an email I just read and I think I skipped it by accident, let me have a look. No, before that one. Alright, so yeah, sorry about the guy in the tree stand, I forgot to read the, he sent me a follow up email, sure one, and it's at the top of the notes, so I, I just caught it. And he wrote back again and said, I'm sorry about the few typos, but I wanted to share a few more details. As the being got closer and stopped, I got the feeling it knew we were there. But I don't believe it knew where we was. I feel that's why it roared. As we walked back, walked back the whole way, I had this gut instinct that this being could have taken me if, if I would have been by myself. I don't know if this helps you. I know you're busy. Keep up the good fight. Excuse me. Okay, man. There you go. Sorry about that, you guys, but I I just caught that. Um, it knew you were there. <laughs> Trust me. It knew you were there. And uh, it roared directly for your benefit. 110%. It knew you were there. And it roared for you. And it could have taken both of you if it wanted to. Just because it... Just saying. Uh, for anybody else out there, if you, it's funny how people, I'm not going there by myself, or I'm not going to go camping by myself, I wouldn't go there by myself. Why not? You know, like, that's the way my, you see what I do by myself. It's like, the, my mind, maybe I'm wrong, but my mind always says, well, what's two people going to do? Whatever, if something's out there, it's going to dust me like nothing. It's going to dust both of us, you know, like, so, 
<laughs> Whatever, right? But I guess it does be, it, humans are a type of herd animal as far as I'm concerned. So humans do, they're just like horses or anything else, feel more confident with the herd, right? Anyway, sorry for that battle. But yeah, I would have to, my opinion would be no, it wouldn't matter if there was three or five human beings. So something like that, what is described and experienced by all of us, some, one of these beings wants you. It's going to take you. If there's five of you, I'm quite certain it's going to dummy all five of you in less than one minute and have its way with whatever way it wants. Just how it is. If they could, if they had permission, possibly. That's another topic. Now, sorry, moving along. Dead Sasquatch found by accident, Kentucky. Hey, Steve. We had written you twice before. Afraid letter one would be too long, then sent letter two of a second experience. We had sent pictures of a tooth found stuck in one of our dead cow's pelvic bone. I remember that. I had taken it next to a bullet. When you read my experience, you read the second one first. The first experience needed to be read first, and the pictures went with that one. You had requested a picture with the tooth in hand. I'm not sure if you got it. My wife also took one next to her, her tooth. I know you get thousands, and I know it might not have all come through, and I noticed you said you didn't care how long. Tell it. Thank you. So, I put them in order of experience and sending them in pictures again. Experience number one. And for you do, Doug, you know, Doug here, please don't use my last name. Very small county. Everyone knows where everyone lives. Don't want people coming out looking for trouble. They'll find it, LOL. Okay, <clears throat> there's your name. I was born and raised in Kentucky, very close to the Mammoth Cave area. When I was 10 slash 11 years old, I would sneak out my window and go into the woods at night with a gun. And, this one never, and was never scared of the dark and still ain't. Loved the night skies, carried a gun all my life, and worked at nights a lot in the strip mines. I've seen and heard a lot of things, but this one night was different. But let me back up before I go here. In the early 80s, I was in my late 20s. There was a place I always wanted to explore, and a couple of the elders took me there. We walked far and ended up into a bluff. We were tired, and I sat down on the ground to rest. I had a knife, and I stuck it in the ground. It made a hollow-type sound. I moved some dirt back, and there was a large orange-colored oval-type oval circle under the dirt. Where I'd stuck my knife in the ground, it had cracked it. I started peeling it back, and it was about two inches thick, hard and light as a feather. The elders asked what I had found, and I said, I don't know. I've never seen anything like this. They didn't know either. When I got it all off, I moved the dirt around and my first swipe exposed a rib cage. One rib was broke and a nick was out of the one above it. They were each four fingers wide and a good inch thick or more and was huge. Four inch wide rib is like a whale. In the rib cage was a beaver tail lance head from the Adena period. It was the only piece in it, and it was right where the heart would have been at. His body was laying in a fetal position facing west. The Indians had killed this creature and had mutilated it. They had cut the hands and feet off, and the skull was missing except for the bottom jawbone, and it was broken in the middle. When it was buried, it was not by the Indians. I know how they bury around here, and this was buried by its own kind because I had never seen the orange cover before and have never seen it since to be so thick, hard, and light while withstanding maybe between 2,000 years or longer. I believe it was mutilated so the Indians wouldn't have to face it in their afterlife. The arm bones of the creature from the wrist to elbow was from the tip of my fingers to my shoulder and I was 6'2 and weighed 290 pounds. The jaw bones I could fit my head inside it and have two inches to spare on each side of my head. To make a long story short, with his feet and head added, it would have been well over nine feet tall. I put every piece back in the hole and properly covered whatever it was. Needless to say, the elders told everyone they knew about it. Thirty years later, an elder historian came to me and asked if I would take him there. 
I'd never been back to that area, but I remembered where. And I took him there to study and take pictures. Sadly, it had been dug into by somebody, and there's nothing left. I moved off for work, met my wife, and was living away from here around 11 years. Due to my family's sickness, we moved back here in 2000 and bought a small 80-acre farm. We raised beef, cows, horses, and had four of the meanest protective dogs around. There was going to be a meteor shower, and it was about 1 a.m., and we went out to watch the meteor showers. We were out looking, and suddenly we heard the loudest, different scream slash holler coming from the back end of the farm. I've heard bobcats, bears, mountain lions, and plenty other night animals, and this was not one of them. You could feel it in your chest, like a loud bass at a concert. It kept coming closer, but stayed in the edge of the woods. You could hear, you could tell it walked on two feet by the stomping of a two-foot beat on the branches breaking underneath it, while hollering the whole time it was coming closer. All 20-plus cows had come running towards us and gathered under the security light, scared. All the horses came running from a different field to us. The four ferocious dogs we had were quiet, scared, and gathered around us in a protective way. My wife asked me, have you got your gun? Because I, because I always carried one. But I walked out of the house without it. It's the last time. And she said, don't you think you need one? Well, here she comes carrying about four. She said, I thought I needed a couple. She was shaking inside and out. By this time, it was on the ridge right behind the house. It let out a hellacious scream that vibrated the whole inside of our bodies. We had never heard anything like it but we knew exactly what it was. As the travel through, dogs were letting out strange howling sounds like they were giving warning. You could hear the way it headed because we could hear the screaming of it and the warnings of dogs ahead for about two miles. Our farm sits between two creeks close to the Green River and about 20 minutes to Mammoth Cave Park area. We were playing Torah for about a week, so we hadn't been, <clears throat> so we hadn't been out and we're thinking we better check an electric fence because that might have been where what could have hurt it. Sorry. We better check on electric fence because that might be what could have hurt it. We were constantly fixing fence due to deer running through it. We have a place on the back of our farm we, where the dead cows go. While I was checking the fence, I thought I would see if anything was left of the cow that we had that had died a couple weeks earlier. Coyotes usually clean them up. I went over to it and that pelvis bone had been broken. And when I looked closer, there was a tooth embedded in the bone. Couldn't believe what I was seeing. I did pull it out and still have it. I had to pry it out with force, but careful not to break it. I was in shock seeing this human-like tooth in a dead cow bone. We now think the screaming was because it had broken a tooth off in the bone, or maybe even a young one with a loose tooth because that is where the screaming all started from. Plus, I'm sure getting shocked by the electric fence didn't help any. You could tell that it was in pain and angry by the breaking limbs and hollering as it went through. I took the tooth to my dentist, not telling him the story, and he had no idea. He said it wasn't a dog, but it looked human, but too big for a human. Because of the size of the tooth and the roots on the tooth, he said it was like a human tooth, the one between the eye tooth and canine tooth. We never told anyone this for years. People would call you crazy. But I've talked to about four people, and they have had similar situations. Their family and their friends were run off from backwoods camping around a large pond not far from here, a couple years before we had our encounter. They had to leave everything and come back at daylight to get their stuff. They can't send the tooth off because people have tried other native and odd items, and they never get them returned back from local universities or other places. Yeah, no doubt. Good call. They always seem to get lost, or they don't remember you. Steve, I'm so glad I found your show. It's good to know there is others that have experienced similar events. It has helped us to be aware of their ways in the uh, of their ways while in the woods. They are not apes. They're intelligent and more human. I know this is long, and my wife and I have had other occurrences recently, but I'll text them later. Thanks, Steve. Glad you could. Tell this and not be laughed at or look like I'm crazy. I have no reason to ever lie. There's, there's several things. Don't like liars and thieves and two of them. Sorry. 
Liars and... Sorry. I have no reason ever to lie. There, There's a several things I don't like. Liars and thieves are two of them, and I'm neither. We love to explore in the woods, either by foot or horseback. I've come across some amazing places. From that night forward, my wife never went out on the farm or yard again without her gun. See at bottom for second set of pictures you asked for. Second experience. I think you read this one and asked for better pictures. They are above. Experience number two. I forgot to send you the picture of the tooth. I used a 38 special bullet to try to show the size. I remember this, so that means I probably read this. This is found in the bone of a cow's pelvis. Okay, yeah, got it, man. We read that one. Okay, here's the photo. It's perfect. Now, my suggestion to you would be to take this tooth and uh, if you have a, you got, you've got livestock, so you probably have a local veterinarian, right? Go take it to your veterinarian. They are, they should be very knowledgeable people and they may be able to eliminate some possible questions you or others may have about what that tooth is, all right? Because I remember before we posted that, somebody said, that's obviously a cow's tooth. So, um, but I have, I like my local, one of my veterinarians in the past, was a good friend, and uh, I was amazed at how knowledgeable he was. So I showed him the skull of this monster grizzly bear I shot years ago, and, and it was, the skull was starting to rot up here, and he pointed out that was the beginning of his demise, so that was going to kill that bear, and in fact, to go right into his head. And then I showed him another skull that I had, and it had a hole in his forehead, a cougar, big old cougar, and it had a, that much of the tip of a tooth in that hole, and it was all healed and grown over, so it was years ago. And he said that, I'll never forget, he told me that that is the signature, because it was a male cat, and that was a signature of him nearly getting dusted by another male cougar, and that's their classic signature of killing, is biting the skull of their prey, especially when it comes to other cats. So that was really interesting, and um, it, it also showed me that those the veterinarians they do have a lot of knowledge besides just house cats and dogs. Okay, so you may want to, it may be a safe place for you to just take that tooth to a veterinarian and say, hey, you know what this is from? But don't let them keep it. And as far as finding that thing in the ground, that's freaking crazy. And I wonder who ended up with that, right? The Smithsonian come to mind, maybe you guys, or somebody linked up with those dark sons of bitches that have been constantly keeping our true history hid from us along with the Vatican. Another topic for another time. But anyway, all right, I can bring it going and I will share more voices again right away. And I think I checked on the GoFundMe link for the DNA study, which I am convinced is very important for us to find out the results and have it and see this through. I believe it is pretty important. So, um, I think we believe we have her, Dr. Melba Ketchum's GoFundMe. I think it's up pushing $12,000, a $20,000 um, goal. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm willing to throw down another hundred bucks. I'll do that when I go in the house. And hopefully, what I checked in the last video, there's something like 65,000 people watched yesterday's, the day before yesterday's video. 65,000 people watch that video. And I'd imagine the majority of those people didn't watch it just for entertainment, because I'm not really entertaining, <laughs> right? So uh, if 65,000 people watched the last video I posted, that means there is a shit pile of people interested in this topic and they're looking for answers. So my message to all those people are, throw down 50 cents. A dollar. And let's get this study completed. And then we'll get some serious answers um, available to us. And then we will share as much truthful information with each other and the world as we can, all right? Without being stopped. So I'll put the link to that GoFundMe, the DNA study in the description below again with this one. And hopefully uh, we can just hurry up and get this 20 grand that is required for the DNA study sewn up, done, and move forward. All right? I'm down. I'm in. I'm going in again. And I will... Uh, be back shortly.
something about being on the river at first light, you know? Or something about being on the river for first light. Actually, it doesn't matter where. It doesn't ma matter where you are on the planet, what you're doing. Being on outside when the sun comes up in nature, in the real world, is, uh, is really, really good. I told us this morning, I got out of the truck, a parking spot there at a, at a different river. And, uh, there's five elk right there watching me. A couple of them down. It's pretty cool to see, right? And you don't see that stuff unless you're out uh, in the woods early. Let's yeah, try. Water's real clear. Usually I have good luck in a corky, but. <clears throat> I think I haven't caught one on a pink worm for a long time. I forgot my needle with thread on. I hope there's a hook in here. Give them, the, give them the worm first, if there's one down there. And uh, see what they think of that. Normally I have these threaded on with a needle all ready to go, but I haven't been, really been using the worm too much because it's funny when you, when you have good success on something, it's hard to not use it again, which has been the orange, pale orange corky really done well. I've had them on this, this spinning glow is a favorite too, this orange spinning glow. Ever since I was a kid that was always the go-to was a small orange spinning glow. I haven't had a whole pile of luck with, with red. Don't know why. Maybe it's just because I haven't given it too much of a chance. So I'm using another hook to uh, thread my leader through this rubber worm. Go. I'll wet it. it. Slides on easier. There we go. Well, I don't know. I think it's a liter, about what is that? 18 inches or something? 20? No signs of bears yet, there should be bears here pretty quick. I got my GoPro on my knee. First time I've done that this year. I can't believe I've thought of doing that before. So get that real cool underwater footage of steelhead. I got three split shot. That's enough. The river's not too deep. Where they usually lay in here, it's probably about, I'm gonna guess about five feet deep, four feet deep. So, let's see what's gonna happen. Set up the camera. I'm gonna bring the camera into the river with me up there, get a better angle, so we can get the hit and the fight and hold my yards if there's one here. Just for a change up with me out there. Set it up and wade back here. Here we go. Let's see if they want to play with this this morning.
like that.
there at night. Word. I found in this particular hole sometimes if I stay put right here, they'll bite right away in the, in the shelter, in the, in the secure spot of the boulders. Sometimes I wonder if they're just not moved up into the deep yet from feeding. I don't like to go down the tail out here because it's so shallow and it's clear. I'm sure they'll see me. I don't want to speak to so. I'll just keep casting away here until I'm confident put this one here and then I'll run the camera down and see what was down there. Very rarely is there not one. Or at least a nice cup there. Let's just share for upwards of an hour. Nothing and then all of a sudden it's gone. Bam, bam. I mixed up the uh, presentation a couple times. I'll change it up. But if there's one in there right now, I'm guaranteed he's seen this go by, as well as the pink mark. So. I moved up about, I don't know, 800 meters. Let's see if they're up here, maybe.
tough slugging today. Let's run the camera down this hole, see if there's any good food in
Tough slugging. Tough slugging.